Hey there and welcome to the Code Wrinkles channel. In this video, I want to show you and ultimately give to you your ultimate clean architecture solution template. And I know that the internet is full of such templates, but believe me, this is not just a template. This is a full blown solution. It's actually an application that I'm working on right now as a side project and it works and, or it is about tracking fitness activities. Therefore, I would like to show you how you can combine 100% adherence to the clean architecture principles while also staying very pragmatic with things that you do in your application. So you can literally take this application that I have here right now and take it as a reference for most of the projects that you will probably work on. And since there's a lot of source code that we will take a look at, Please remember that all Code Recnels ambassador members and higher will get access to the source code after the video is uploaded. So if you are not already a Code Recnels ambassador member or higher, please make sure to join the membership and check the membership tab of the Code Recnels YouTube channel to get information about how you can access the source code after this video is published. So let's dive right into it. And the first thing that I want to concentrate on, because literally in all projects, you will see something that's called common or shared or utils or something like that. And most often that I see, basically people put in there whatever they don't know exactly where to put. And this from my point of view, not the optimal approach. Now, one thing that I wanted to do here with this application is show you a use case where this common project actually might make sense. The idea is that as we are building a fitness tracking application that will be probably used by users both in the US and also in Europe and all over the world, some users might want to kind of like use that application in the imperial measurement system, while other users might want to use it in the metric measurement system. Therefore, we have different concepts like height, weight, distance that are expressed differently based on that. So that's a primary use case when this type of common assembly might make sense in a .NET solution. Now, if we take a look here, what we have defined are things that are really expressed differently based on some options. So first of all, we have some enums here where is only the measurement system. And for now, the measurement system could be either metric or imperial. And then we have different type of types. Now we have, first of all, distance. Now on the distance, we have kind of like created a lot of logic basically based on this I measurement convertible interface that we have defined in the abstraction folder in the same assembly. So each type that we use and that is an I measurement convertible needs to implement the convert from metric to imperial and the other one, which is the convert from imperial to metric and another method, which is just convert, which will figure out if it needs to convert from metric to imperial or vice versa, and we'll do the conversion afterwards. And then we have, for instance, this height. Now, this height obviously is a type that we will use throughout our entire application, throughout all the layers of the application, we'll use this concept, even in the API. That's why I've done here some concessions, because usually when we expose this through the API, we, we don't want to have an identifier on that, so I have this JSON ignore attribute here. But on the other hand, this takes in as a constructor always a value and a measurement system. So that we know exactly, okay, what type of height is that? And here we have these properties that kind of like hold that information and we implement those methods from the interface, which is convert from metric to imperial, convert from imperial to metric, and then the other type of conversion. Now, since we also implement here the I equatable and I comparable interface for this, we implement this bool equals, this override bool equals, and then the get hash code and the operators so that we get a consistent behavior whenever we want to compare to height instances. Then on speed, for instance, is the same. We, it is an I measurement convertible. So we have here a double value and a measurement system. And then here we have here convert from metric to imperial, convert from imperial to metric, and also the regular or the simple convert plus all the equals and the operators override. Now for the weight, we have exactly the same things that we do. It's really exactly the same. Now, once again, I want to emphasize the core principle here is that these are types that are common that will be used basically through all the different layers of the application. They are not layer specific. They are actually system specific. So if you will work in a company that kind of like does this, let's say on a day-to-day -day job and might have even several different applications in this problem domain, 
then probably this common assembly that we have right now would be reused even throughout different projects. Now that we have this out of the way, the next layer that I want to take a look at is the domain layer. So according to the clean architecture principles, as we know, this is, these are the business entities and it's the layer that is actually at the core of our application. Now, I really don't want to make this connection between clean architecture and domain driven design. And I know that literally or virtually almost any video or blog post or information that you will find about clean architecture, they always also talk about domain driven design, but these are not equal. You could definitely have clean architecture without thinking about domain driven design concepts. And you could obviously have domain driven design without being 100% compliance to the clean architecture. So the way that I would like to structure my domain layer is here very simple. Instead of having a very convention based folder structure, I prefer a folder structure that expresses kind of like the behavior or the logic of the application. That's why for now we have here activities and here we have some abstractions for activities like what is a high distance activity. It's an activity that contains a distance, obviously I elevation activity. That's an, eleva that's an activity that contains an elevation and I speed activity. That's an activity that contains speed. And then we have the types or the different activity types. We have this activity first, which is kind of like the base class, which has all the properties that are common for all activities. But then we have different activities like cycling and cycling is okay. An activity, but it is an eye elevation activity, eye speed activity and eye distance activity, because you want to measure all of these type of aspects when you do a ride. And then we have some, we implement all these properties and the total elevation is something that we actually calculate. It's not something that we want to store in the database. For running, basically it's also an activity and it's an eye distance activity because here what we do want to do is measure usually the distance that we run. Although I'll give it to you, it would also make sense to have elevation also on your running. But when I created this application, I was thinking more about running on a track. Then we have this other activity, which is walking, and that's also an activity and it is an eye distance activity. This one also contains another important information that we would like to track for walks, which is the number of steps that we have walked. Then the question is, okay, who tracks all these activities? Well, athletes do track these activities. Therefore, I have this athletes folder and here I have this athlete class. And in this athlete class, obviously we have, well, different information like the identifier. We will have also an identity ID, and this is how we will implement authentication and authorization and how we'll actually bind our athlete, like an instance of athlete or an athlete to a certain identity user. And we look at this just in a few minutes. So obviously here we have things like the first name, last name, um, email address, location, URI, profile settings, gender, height, weight, and an eye collection of activities because we want to be able to get all the activities of a certain athlete. And then we have this very simple enum, which is gender, female, uh, male, other location, which contains some information about the country, region, and the city and the profile settings, which kind of like, well, we'll hold the measurement system that is preferred by that specific athlete. And it's also the preferred time zone because in the future, we want to probably support time zones in this application. And that's virtually all that we need for our domain layer right now. Obviously we don't have very complex logic yet. So there is no rich domain model. So we don't have them. We don't have a lot of logic in the models, but later if we need to add domain specific logic about the workout, how do you calculate some things? We will add them in these workout or activity types that we have defined here as classes. Cool. Now that we have the domain layer out of our way, let's move over to our application layer. Now, according to clean architecture, this application layer, which is the use cases layer is actually the glue that orchestrates the entire application together. So it's actually the place where you implement not necessarily business logic, but application logic that knows exactly different types of infrastructure with which it needs to interact in order to fulfill a certain request or to respond or to perform a certain type of use case. And since I want to adhere to the clean architecture principles in this solution, I have here an abstraction folder. And obviously here we have the data abstraction. And that's a very important point. If you want to follow clean architecture, the client, the assembly, the layer that will need 
to use kind of like what these abstractions do is the application layer because this is our orchestrator of the application. And therefore, it's only normal and logical to, well, define the interfaces of the repositories in this application layer and the implementation for them will be in the infrastructure data layer. So we have here an iActivity repository. And if you take a look at this repository, you see that it's not just a CRUD repository. So it's not like create, update, delete. No, here we want to describe some very specific business processes or operations that yes, in our case, we'll have to do something with a database, but they should still express in a certain way what we want to achieve here. So that's why we have, for instance, this log walking async instead of having simply create async or something like that. Now for the get, we have this get walking activity, but if we want to log a run, we have this log run async. Uh, then we have log cycling async, and we also have show activity log async, for instance, which displays a log of all the different activities for a start date and an end date. So that's the repository that we have defined here. For the athlete, we also have a repository that would contain methods to register a new athlete in our application, but display the athlete profile async, then change athlete basing information, change athlete location async, and change athlete body info async. And that's really a very important thing. And I have created a video a few months ago about why your applications are usually failing because you try, for instance, when you do an update, you try to end to update an entire entity at once. And that's actually a very bad thing to do. So please go and check out that video to, to understand more or well, better what I mean when I think about this idea of having a task-based application, not really big update operations, but instead smaller updates or patch informations in or on certain entities. Last but not least, here I have also the unit of work. And once again, if you have watch other videos on my channel, you know that I'm not really always a friend of having a unit of work. And there are different reasons why I really don't like that, because obviously if you're using Entity Framework Core, we already have a unit of work and we already have repositories there because the DB sets in the end are repositories. But since we want in this application to really stick 100% to this clean architecture principles, I have this unit of work. Now, what I like to do on my unit of work is not only have these methods for start transaction, submit transaction, and revert transaction, which are important in a unit of work, and we'll see also exactly why and where we use them, but I would also like to have properties that contain my repositories. And the reason why I want to do that, and you'll see this just in a few seconds, is that as the application grows, probably in a, a handler, a use case, I will need several different repositories, maybe five or six repositories. So instead of injecting all those repositories in the constructor there and kind of like having a lot of code there or a lot of repositories that are injected, I prefer to have them on the unit of work. So I inject only the unit of work and I have access to everything that I need to perform certain tasks that involves a database. Now, besides these abstractions, I also like to arrange or to structure my folders in the application layer based on what the application does or based on the different use cases, or you can even call it or call them business processes. That's why you see that I have folders for activities, for athletes, for identity, and we have this extensions folder at which we will also take a look just in a few seconds. Now, the first thing is this identity. Obviously, this regards ASP.NET Core Identity and how do we handle identity in our application? Obviously, we will need to implement JSON Web Token Authentication and Authorization, and it's already implemented. And I will show you uh, just in a few minutes how I implemented that. But you see that everything that's related to this idea of identity management in my application right now is in this folder. So here, for instance, I have a current athlete, uh, athlete which is basically a service that for now, for me, held, uh, holds only the GUID of the, of the current athlete that makes a request and the identity ID. These are the options that I have here. But this idea of having a current user or a current athlete or a current whatever you want to call it in your application is very important. And you could even have here a lot of different other information like the first name, last name, location, whatever makes sense for your application. You can have this in this current user, let's call it service, because you will see it is added as a service to the DI container and you can access it basically very easily. 
And that's why we here inject the HTTP context accessor. And what we'll do is, well, if the user is authenticated, we'll simply look in the claims for the claim that contains the athlete ID and for the claim that contains the identity ID. Now, since this one, I am using GeoIDs on my athletes, this will be of GeoID, so we have to cast it to the default GeoID and then make it a string. Uh, but then, what we'll need to do here for the other one, like the identity ID, which comes from ASP.NET Core Identity, which uses by default a string, then here I will just have string.empty. Then I have this identity service class, and this identity service class is not something very complicated, and it's meant primarily to generate JSON web tokens. And for that, we have this JWT settings, which is used in the options pattern or with the options pattern in ASP.NET Core to actually get the information about the signing key, the issuer, and the audience from the, our application settings for from the app settings to JSON. Now, once again, this is placed here for convenience, especially the signing key. Obviously, you don't want to hold your signing key in your app settings to JSON file. You probably want to use an Azure Key Vault or HashiCorp or something more secure. But for the sake of simplicity right now, the signing key is part of my app settings to JSON. So as the identity service, it takes in the I options of GWT settings. It does here some uh, validations. Basically, if I don't have some required information from my app settings or JSON file, I just want to throw exceptions here. And then we have this property, which is a J JWT security token handler. And we have here a few methods like create security token that takes in a claims identity and basically creates a token. And then this writes token, which actually writes the token string, which will be the base 64 string. And then we have here this get token descriptor that will contain some information about the token and the key that is used basically to sign this specific token. And then from the application use case perspective, we have just two very important things here. We have this register and here this register method is kind of, or this register handler is actually very, very important because this is where we do the user registration. Now, the things that we that, that I wanted to show you here is that we need to perform different things basically here on our identity and on our athlete. But instead of injecting a lot of different repositories, I just inject the unit of work and I also need the user manager and the identity service. Now, what I do here and here, this is the very important thing here because this type of operation or use case requires two operations that need to fulfill or need to complete at the same time. Or if one of the operations fails, then none of them should be persisted in the database. So that's why I'm starting here a transaction. Then first of all, I use this create identity user async method, which is a private method, which creates me an identity user. Then I have here create athlete async that creates an athlete. And it's kind of like, they also use the user manager to create the identity user. And here we use the athlete repository to register the athlete. And then when everything is ready, we need to get some uh, identity and athlete information claims, which is the identity ID and the athlete ID. Then we need to persist these claims to ASP or with the help of ASP.NET Core Identity in the database. ASP.NET Core Identity has already tables for that. That's why we still here use this user manager add claims async. And the thing is then we submit the transaction. And only then, if everything is okay, what we do here is, well, we do submit the transaction and we return this registration result. But if we encounter an exception anywhere in this part, basically we will enter the execution here and I will revert the entire transaction. So this guarantees me that no matter what happens, so if this fails or if this fails or if this fails or even if this fails, the operation will not complete successfully and no information will be written in the database in none of the tables. That's why I use the transaction here. Now for the login, the things are very, very similar. I have here a user manager, a sign -in manager and the identity service that I need. And here there are once again, a bunch of different things that we do here, like the find by email async, go to see, if, to, to check if we can find the email. Then I want to check if the combination of password or email is correct. So that's why I use the sign in manager to do that. So if everything is okay, then we just need to get the claims via the user manager, the claims that we have persisted in a database during the registration, we need them on the token each time a new user logs in. So we need to get them from the database. And then we have this get JWT string, 
that uses our identity service to get our JSON string and then we return the login result. And that's pretty much for identity. Let's go now for athletes and here for athletes to see that we have different use cases like the change at athlete ad basic info here, things are very straightforward because we have the unit of work, we have the repository of athletes, and here we have this change athlete basic info. So this type of use case doesn't really require a lot of orchestration like we have seen, for instance, when we did the user registration and the login. And the same is for change athlete body info, that changes only the body info of the athlete, change athlete location. This obviously use case changes only the location of the athlete and display athlete profile. This kind of like displays the entire athlete profile that we would need to show in our application. And here we have also the record athlete profile that we actually return and it will be consumed or used by our API layer. Now for activities, obviously we have here kind of like a substructure of folders because I want to have kind of like different use cases for cycling. Like here, for instance, I have a get rides and log cycling activity. Like the get rides obviously gets the rides, log cycling activity logs the cycling activities here. So we have this handle and here we once again use the unit of work. We want to start a transaction in this case, we create a new activity and then, uh, well, we just log it and then we submit the transaction. If something's wrong, then we just reverse the, the transaction. The same goes for running, where we have here get running activities, for instance, and this will get the running activities, log running activities, and then we have running activity, which is the activity that the contract basically that will be returned by our handler. And the same goes also for walking, where we have this get walking activities, which is an I request, log walking activity, and the walking activity that will be used or we'll use basically to return from, from our handler. And the last thing that we have here is an extensions. And here, that's a very simple extension. And it's simply an extension method that registers all the services that the application layer needs to register. So it adds mediator because we use I request and I request handler, and uh, we add the identity service. So it's the service that we use to generate JSON web tokens. And we add a scoped service that needs to be scoped. It's very important, which is the current athlete. So in your application, if you don't have athletes, if you have user, that could be something like a current user or something similar to that. Obviously, this method is called in the program.cs file in our API layer. However, before we move to the API layer, let's go briefly also through my data layer. So here in my data layer, obviously I have the migrations and, 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 and everything that's needed for that. But first of all, I have the repository. So I have the activity repository. And you see that in the activity repository, I return the types that are required or requested by the application layer. So it's okay that this layer, this infrastructure data layer depends on the application layer. So here we have basically this, okay, log walking activity. What does this even mean? Here is get walking activity. And here we are using projections. We use this select. It's very important to always use projections. And for the log running here, uh, once again, we just need to log something. So it's, we basically create something, but when we do just regular queries, we always use projections so that we get from the database only the things that we need for that specific use case. And so on and so forth. These are all the methods that are implemented here. In the athlete repository, we have the implementation for all the methods on, on the athletes. And here, for instance, we also use projections when we kind of like want to return some information, like for instance, for this athlete profile, we don't really want to return everything that's on the athlete, but for instance, just a subset of the properties. So that's why we use the projection. Hey there. Then we have all this change athlete basic information, change athlete location async, change athlete body information async, and so on and so forth. So it's really not very complicated. Now we also have the physicube DB context which inherits the identity B context because we want to use also ASP.NET Core identity. And here we also get into the constructor a DB context options, but also the current athlete. So you might ask, why do we actually get the current athlete here? And here I'll show you a use case. So for now, I was thinking about this application as being in a certain way, let's call it a very basic multi-tenant. Meaning that me as an athlete, I should be able to only see my workouts, my activities, creating activities, but I don't really want to see any activities, some fees or anything from other athletes. So really everything that happens in this application 
should always happen with the current athlete that is logged into the application. So what we've done here is in on model creating, I have added a query filter. So for activity, I said that it has a query filter and the query filter is basically the athlete ID from the current athlete. So this means that every time I do a request to get, for instance, an athlete without specifying a where condition where I specify the athlete ID, Entity Framework Core will automatically add this as a query to all my queries to the database. And the same we do for the athlete because I just want to be able to, well, see the information about the athlete that's currently signed in and, and working with the application. So we have also a query filter for that. And then we also call the on model creating so that we make sure that the identity B context also configures everything that it needs in order to work properly. And the unit of fork is very simple. Here we just get a DB context and then we get the different repositories. So that's why here we assign the repositories to the properties that we use as repositories. And once again, I've used that or I like to use this when I have this type of setup, because in this case, I don't really have to inject every repository in, in, in the handlers where I need them, but I just inject the unit of work and everything is already there and I can start using that. Also in this, I have here the service collection extensions that basically adds the data services. So we have this add DB context, but then we also add the I athlete repository. We add the I activity repository and we add the I unit of work, which is in my case, this physicube unit of work class. But since this is the concern of this layer, I like to have this extension method in this layer and simply call it or invoke it from my API where we need to wire everything up with the DI container, container of ASP.NET Core. Now, before we move to the API, which is the final part of this application, there is one important thing that I wanted to show you. So notice here that in this naming here, I have physicube.infrastructure.data. Now, there is a reason why I do this, because theoretically, even kind of like, it doesn't mean in an application that each project is a layer. You could have a layer that spans different projects. And usually in most of the applications that I have worked with, this data layer like infrastructure and data, or more specific, the data part of the infrastructure becomes fairly big with a lot of different configurations and things that need to be added here. But on the other hand, we might, we might use email services to send emails. We probably will use Azure services to connect to different, uh, well, uh, Azure platform as a service offerings to kind of like help us out, like for instance, Azure Key Vault or Blob Storage. So I want to keep all these type of concerns separated in different assemblies. They all are part of the infrastructure layer, but I want to keep them or I like to keep them better organized. So I usually end up having something like PZCube Infrastructure Data, PZCube Infrastructure Azure, PZCube Infrastructure Notifications for sending emails, for instance, or SMS or things like that. But feel free to kind of like arrange or, or, or create your, your projects or organize your projects the way that it makes sense basically for your application because all my application will have is only this type of repositories and it wouldn't make sense to create really a new project for the Azure services. So I would still have it in the same project. Okay, now let's move over to this other API project. Now this API project is kind of like very important because really it's set up with everything that you need to get started with an API as fast as possible. It has authorization, it has authentication, it has Swagger. Swagger is also configured to use authorization. So you can basically add a JSON web token to Swagger and Swagger will automatically add it as a header to all requests that you try out. So let's take a look a little bit of what we have here. And in this case, I like to start from this program.cs. Because here in this program dossier, probably will use this with a single page application. And I have started to also work on an Angular application. So first of all, we add the course services. And here, well, I added a default policy for the origins, which are these that will be used basically by my Angular single page application. Then we add the controllers. And for the controllers, I add a global exception handling filter. Now, if you have watched other videos, I have a video dedicated in explaining what's the difference of having, well, a global exception handling middleware versus having a global exception handling filter. My personal preference is to have a filter. 
However, this is nothing wrong if you have a middleware. So if you have a global exception handling middleware, that's totally fine. That's no problem. So it doesn't mean that you should do it like this. It's just a personal preference of mine to use this exception handler filter. And then we have builder services edge swagger. Now in this edge swagger, that's actually an extension method that I have created. And here we actually, well, add the endpoints API explorer. And then we add Swagger Gen. And this is how we configure Swagger to actually know how to work with JSON Web Token authorization for our request. So we just have this uh, add Swagger Gen. For the options, we spe specify a document with version and the open API uh, info. And then we add a security definition. And I want to add a security definition that has the name bearer and it is an open API security scheme in which we want to specify different things. First of all, we want to have this bearer basically always in the header. So that's why we have the parameter location header. Then we have a description and the name, then the type security scheme HTTP, bearer format, it should be JSON web token because that's what we want to use and the scheme, which is the bearer. And then we also need to add a security requirement and for this, we need to add a new open API security scheme with a reference, which is an OPI reference. And here it should also contain a new string array. If you ask me why exactly we need that, I don't know exactly, but that's what we need in order to get Swagger to work. Then if we stay at the same file, here we also have where we configure authentication and authorization for our application. So the first thing that we actually do here is we use our JWT settings basically to bind them from our app settings to JSON file. And once we have them, well, we add authentication. Since we want to have JWT bearer authentication, we use this JWT bearer default authentication scheme board for or all for the default authentication scheme for the default scheme and for the default challenge scheme. But then we also need to provide this add JWT bearer with different types of options. And I won't really explain everything in depth here because literally the video before this one is about how you can configure this. And in that video, I really go into more detail about what everything here does. But generally we want to kind of like define exactly how do we want to validate the token. And we want to kind of like define the audience of the token and the claims issuer for the token. Now, the next step after we do this, because now we have configured ASP.NET Core basically to know, to look in the headers for an authorization header and to validate the token against the options that we have here. But then what we need to also, because we are using ASP.NET Core identity, we need to build the services at identity core. And here we are using identity user. Here I've set some options for the password and to keep everything simple, I have set here mostly everything on false. But then here, the user ID claim type, I have defined that I want it to be the identity ID. And then we also need to work with roles at a certain point. So we want to add the roles services to our application and the sign-in manager, because the sign-in manager we use to check, for instance, if the combination of username and password are correct. And we also want to wire everything up or ASP.NET Core Identity with Entity Framework Core. That's why we have this add entity framework stores and we specify which exactly is the DB context for our application. And that's just it. That's how you basically configure authentication in your application, in your ASP.NET Core Web API. And that's how you can also configure Swagger in order to know how to work with JSON web tokens when you make different calls. Now, here is the exception filter that we have. First of all, I have defined an error return type, which is a status code, status phrase, and a timestamp. So nothing really, really fancy. But the idea here is that in this exception handler, so I have an on exception, and then I can, well, do a switch on the exception. And well, based on if it's a user not found exception, I will return something. If it's a user registration failed exception, I will return something else. Then the default, I will return a status code 500. But here I can extend this literally with all different types of exceptions that I have. I can even use exception filters to define exceptions more granularly here. So yeah, feel free to kind of like adapt this the way that you need it for your application. Now, regarding the controllers, we have once again here, or I prefer to kind of like have a folder structure that also shows a little bit about the functionality of the application. So I have out and here I have only an out controller. So here in this out controller, obviously I have just two very simple methods. We have this register, which kind of like 
takes in the register. And here, no, this is a method that I think it's very practical and it works for most small and even mid-sized applications. So instead of defining different types, like for your APIs and for uh, your request handlers or for your iRequest, I basically use the iRequest that I define in my application layer for the use case as an incoming parameter here from the body, for instance. So that's really okay. And that kind of like allows you to avoid using different mapping strategies, either through AutoMapper, Mapster, or other libraries, or manual mapping or tree extension methods. You simply don't need to do that. So that's why I say that for most applications, this might be a good idea because it avoids a lot of code and it keeps things really practical from my point of view. And the only things that we do in the controllers is literally, well, just send this I request to the mediator and well, get the result back and return it. And that's basically it. Now here I have, for instance, also for athletes, where I have an athlete controller, where essentially I do exactly the same thing. So here, as you can see here, display athlete profile, we just send uh, this I request to the mediator here with update basic information. This is once again, if we take a look, it's the I request that I have defined in the application layer. So that's what I'm taking from the body. I don't use different or dedicated API contracts. I don't need any, any type of mapping right now. And literally the only thing I do is use the mediator and send the things. If, well, I have another result, it seems that probably is a bad request. And if not, I just return okay. Then we have this update location. It's exactly the same thing. We get, in this case, we just get the location. Remember location is part of our common library. So yeah, here we get a location. Then we create a new change at this location where we provide the location and send it to the mediator. For the body info, we do exactly the same thing. And actually it's exactly the same procedures that we have for activities. And here, for instance, once again, we have several different methods here. And yeah, we just do things, but here, please note one important thing. Here, I have set this authorize, both on this controller and on this athlete controller. So this makes sure that basically only authorized users are able to actually call this endpoint. And that's basically it. That's the entire application. As I said, it's working. I also have parts of an Angular frontend for that. If you want a video on the Angular frontend for this application, please let me know in the comments and I'll make sure to create also a video on how you can create an Angular frontend for the application that we have right now. But in the meantime, I will also work on this application as a side project. So the application will probably become larger and larger. And once again, if you want to get access to the source code, really all the code that you have seen in this video, you can get access to it if you are a Code Wrinkles ambassador member or higher. So if you are not, just make sure to become a member and check the membership tab of the Code Wrinkles YouTube channel to get the information about how to access the source code for this specific video, but obviously also for all the other videos that I have published previously. This being said, thank you very much for watching and until the next time, I wish you the very best.